Now, our today's lecture is going to be about using examples and how to survive without them. So there are so many times that we're in a debate and we just don't know what it's about or what the motion is about, or sometimes that we do have no like a general idea of what the motion is about, but we end up not having any examples to use, or we have like so much examples on the best case, you know, um, and we have too many examples that we don't know how to effectively use them in the debate. So I'm going to cover those two things in today's lex lecture. Yes. Um, so here's just an overview of how, what I will cover here. The first thing I'm going to talk about is what, just an overview of what analysis and examples are. Then we're going to talk about um, the exam the worst nightmare that we usually have encountered so much in debate, which is what if we don't know anything about the debate or anything about the motion. And I'll also talk about how do you survive um, debates without the, having to need examples. Then I'll also talk about, fourthly, using examples actually and then last I'll talk about matter loading so you know you like you can't matter load if you can't use examples if you obviously don't matter load so this is gonna be tips for that um yeah okay so just jump right to it so let's jump right to it what are analysis and what are examples yeah so this is like the basic template of what an argument looks like. It starts with a premise, an analysis, and a conclusion. So anything that has any of these three things are generally already an argument. So an argument doesn't have to be um, pragmatic or principle. An argument is just anything that contains any of these three. So what you might know them as is a claim. So for example, a claim or an analysis still analysis and then you have an outcome or the effect or um, something related to the motion anything you want to prove that's probably your conclusion right so the point of an analysis and example is helps you achieve the goals which is either one prove that the initial claim is true or prove that the outcome eventually happens so a lot of the times in debates, we get the comment from a judge who says like, oh, I didn't know if this claim or this premise was particularly true. And so that's where the analysis has to come from. Or they say like, I wasn't sure how we got to the outcome. And that's again where the analysis comes from. So creating a thicker or more solid foundation for analysis helps you be able to do that. For example, in a debate, let's say your initial claim is mothers want what's best for children. Then you jump to the conclusion and say, therefore, mothers will always get their children vaccinated because um, that's what's best for their children. Probably as a judge, they'll ask you, is it true that mothers always want what's best for their children? So that's where I think like analysis has to come in to explain that that initial statement is true. And I think one of the ways that we are able to clearly be able to do this is by showing um, some examples or by demonstrating it better. So there are two ways that you can demonstrate something to be true or your initial claim or even your conclusion is a likely outcome. So you have analytical rigor, analytical rigor or factual evidence. So your analytical rigor is using logic or something is logically true. That's what you want to derive that by these sets of points, therefore the conclusion happens. Or in examples, use factual evidence like we've seen this here, or um, this is what usually happens in this instance, right? So both things I would suggest help prove that things are true or help you prove that what your claim is actually does happen. So I in a debate, for you to have an effective debate, you have to have the best of both worlds. You can't just have analytical rigor. You can't just have uh, factual evidence because even when you present factual evidence a lot of the times judges are like mm, but is that true especially in debates where both sides have so much matter and so much examples and so much everything the judge just becomes mm, especially in times where it's contradictory like which one is which and what is really true right same with analytical rigor um, something might be logically true and we fall into this trap. But I think the core assumption of analytical rigor, especially with human behavior, is that humans will always behave in the same way. But a lot of the times we act irrationally. So there is some factual evidence that helps 
prove that your analysis and your logic is true in the real world. So I think it's the use of both things that are important. But if you don't have any examples, I would suggest analysis is the safest place for you or the safest thing for you to use in a so the first thing that I'll talk about then, other than I hope like that was clear, like what's the difference? Um, now I'm gonna talk about what happens if you don't know anything about the debate. And these are my few tips that I can give to you guys. But I would say that don't you worry, don't you worry, don't you worry, child. So the thing is you actually do know something. It's really about making sure that you're able to drag what you know and apply it in this debate. All right, so there are two things that I'm going to suggest. The first thing that you can use is you can always make assumptions based on what you already know. Like motions all have a lot of words and the way that I like to go about them is breaking it apart to the different words that show up in the motion. Like what do I know about this? So for example, in a motion or like this house would impose sanctions at Ethiopia until it ceases construction on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Is such a word fool, right? So like if you're a new debater and you're starting out, it will probably um, scare you a little bit and you probably ask yourself, how do I deal with this motion, right? So one of my key suggestions is really to break down the motion based on things that you already know. Um, you might not know anything about Ethiopia, you might not know anything about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, but things that you do know is probably what is the sanction or what is the construction or what is the dam Right. So a lot of the times, and I think that's why one of the core things we teach new debaters is how to read motions and how to interpret motions for that matter. So, you know, like you would hear like a new prime minister come up and they just be spend a few minutes explaining the example, the words of the motion, like by this we mean, by this we mean, by that we mean. So by sanctions we mean this, by cease construction we mean this, right? So um, in the debate, that the reason why you that's a, always a good place to start is because if you don't know anything, that's where you can rely. So for example, in this debate, you could ask yourself, um, or from what you know, you know that sanctions are punishment. And when you punish, um, there are harms the person being punished, right? But at the same time, you also have to ask yourself, should we punish this person? Um, does this person deserve that punishment? Or you ask yourself, who is getting punished? Is it Ethiopia as a country or is it Ethiopia as people, right? And so I think a lot of these assumptions or a lot of these baseline questions already give you an insight as to how you can deal with the motion eventually later on and what things you can talk about. Um, so you don't really need to start with what is Ethiopia or what is the Grand Renaissance now. The questions you'll probably ask yourself is where is Ethiopia? And you'll know that Ethiopia is in Africa. I mean that like, you should at least know that. Like basic geography, I think that's always an important thing to know. Um, if you don't, um, you can just divide the world into the global north and the global south or the developed world and the developing world. And then there are key assumptions that you can make from what the developed world looks like and what the developing country looks like, right? Um, but you can assume that if you don't know anything about Ethiopia, you can assume that it's in Africa and maybe like a bunch of the countries in Africa are in poverty or a lot of areas are at least. And so you, like these are assumptions that a lot of debaters will just accept to be true. Um, and then you can also say that there are scarce resources and all that. I'm not saying that you should be racist or you should be discriminatory and make biased statements, but I think you can make educated guesses, guesses about what these areas probably look like. Um, or you can ask yourself, if you don't wanna go through like, what is Ethiopia and what's in Africa? You can just ask yourself, what is the dam? And you would know that it controls the flow of water. So you don't need to know like where this dam is located. You just know it's in Ethiopia and who it affects and all that. Um, so yeah, so that's how you would like go around, go about not knowing what you would do. So you put that all together. Um, oh, there's more. So if we're debating this, controlling the flow of water is probably harmful to someone, right? So you'd probably make this assumption that um, 
this dam, like all dams, slow how the river flows, right? So that's probably an assumption that you can also make. Then you would then, so that it kind of starts making sense that, you know what, so if because somebody is harmed by this dam, then should we therefore make these sanctions and impose these sanctions? So should Ethiopia be allowed to do this, right? Uh, we put it all together. So to summarize, you use the words and the motion to make assumptions, and then you can even use generic assumptions to make a baseline case. I would argue that a baseline case and a generic case is better than no case at all. So you might not know exactly what's happening in Ethiopia, but you just need to survive the debate to get to the next debate, right? So the basic case that I would probably run here is that I'm is harming people by limiting their access to water in an already resource starved Africa. So we should therefore sanction Ethiopia so they stop this, right? So that's the generic version. And honestly, this is far from reality. So um, you might want to look it up, but just that insight on what the Grand Ethiopian Resonance Dam is, Renaissance Dam Resonance, um, it's, as far as I know, it is in the, near the start of the River Nile. And so if you know the River Nile, the River Nile leads all the way into Egypt, right? There's so many stories about this. So then you can say, okay, so to fill up a dam, it takes a lot of time. It controls the flow of water, right? So you can make an assumption that, oh, so that means maybe the flow of the water will end up being slower because of the dam and because the dam is being constructed. So what relies on, sorry. Okay, so I can't go back to my side. So what relies on the dam? So the dam is probably, uh, what relies on clean water from a river would probably be farms, irrigation, drinking water. Um, so lifestyles of people would probably be harmed. So that's actually like probably what's really happening on the ground. So if you start with these core assumptions, you're therefore able to make these new assumptions as well coming from that. Um, and then you can make a case from that. So that's really one of your tips to survive a motion that you don't understand. The second thing and the second tip, yeah, my slide went ahead, is stick to the basics of motion reading. So there are two things that you have to look into. The first is what is the type of motion? And second, what is the theme of the motion? I strongly believe, and a lot of people have told me this when I was learning how to debate, that debates are repetitive, repetitive and they rely only on the basic things. And I believe in this so much. Like, um, yeah, so everything that you need to know about debating is just going back to the basics and getting the basics right. I know when you're starting out, it gets super exciting. Like, oh, I want to know everything about the world. I want to debate it and you get frustrated. But as a coach now, I've realized, or as like an old debater, I realized that a lot of the things that we debate about just go in circles and we end up debating the same things over and over again. But the only clear way that we're able to do well in the debate is about how well you use those basic things, right? So pro tip. And so good luck with your career. Okay. So let's first start with types of motion. So there are so many other lectures about this. I would suggest a good material for this are the um, are the world's debating manuals. But like a, just an overview of the types of motion. So there's this house wood, this house beliefs that the surrogates, and there's so many more. Um, so there are value judgments, policies, and after debate. So at its core, I think like these three debates are one about truth value. So is this thing true or not? Or do we want it to be true or not? Or in a world where it is true or not true, what world is more preferable, right? Um, there are also policy debates. So this is about what we should do or what we shouldn't do based on their outcomes or based on the principles that we hold. Then there are after debates, and I think these debates are fundamentally about what the after wants. So the debaters have to prove that this is the particular specific interest of the actor, and the, therefore these are the actions that we will that emanate, well, emanate from that action or from the action that the actor should take. Okay. Um, yes. So when in doubt, you should just go back to these initial analysis. What does the debate want me to do? Um, so you might not have like the most specific case, but a generic case again is better than 
no case at all. And I think this is a really great place to start. So if it's a regrets motion, you would know that it's retrospective. So for if it's retrospective, you'd know that you have to look back into the past. So you know that this motion is talking about an action that probably happened in the past, right? And then you start breaking it down more to what we talked about earlier, Drake make assumptions, make these core assumptions and core questions, right? So that's it for types of motions. And then you can also look at the theme of the motion. So I think there are just like, I don't know like how many exactly, but generally there are probably like 10 themes of motions. The basic ones would be social, legal, movements, international relations, economics, finance, um, education, media, philosophy, science, med. There are other themes that I didn't indicate here because it was at the top of my mind and I was making this PowerPoint. So each of these have core questions that need answers or regardless of what the motion actually says. So like a list of the ones that I could think of. So if it's a social legal motion, so these motions are usually about what constitutes the crime and what should be legal or what should be allowed, what should people be permitted to be able to do. So this is usually from the perspective of the government, right? So I think these set the direction or at least the perspective by which you want to take the debate to eventually. So most crimes are about two things. One, what is a crime? What constitutes a crime? So there has to be motive and there has to be um, a crime that's committed, right? So if the person wanted to do something bad and something bad happened, then you do actually have a crime. So sometimes the lack of uh, the intent to do crime, the mens rea, means that um, their, their, the crime or the punishment is therefore diminished. So debates about social legal are one, like is there a crime, but there's also second on how should we therefore punish the crime. Um, and they're not different. They're not the same thing because you can commit a crime, but your punishment might not be the same as other crimes, right? So, to start off with your analysis and to making your case, I think that's a great place to start by answering these core questions. For movements, I think a lot of the time they're just about what the movement needs or what the movement wants to achieve. So I think this requires a clear assessment of where we are today. And if there's a debate, then there's probably a problem, right? So there's probably a problem that the movement still want to solve in society and in status quo. IR motions are about the transfer of power. And it's a question on who should have that power and what do the players or the actors and the international community want out of a particular action or a particular policy. I think similarly, if econ finance are about where do we get stability and how do we protect the people. So this financial stability. Um, so motions like this also break up big banks. You'd say, oh, we want to prevent another stock market crash and all that. And I think that's an important place to understand that the reason why we would implement particular policies that are financial, it's about making sure the market is stable and then it's about what happens to people on the ground. So for example, having an independent reserve, you know, independent, this house would institute an independent, I know this house, sorry, this is regret the independence of a central bank. So you might not know what a central bank is, but every time something is essential to something, then you can assume that it's the thing that governs everything else or the things that controls them like the ring to control them all or something so a central bank would probably be a bank that controls all the other banks um the motion says regrets the independence so you would assume that the independent bank is independent from other bodies so that could be the government that could be in the private sector so they make their own decisions right so from there, you can say like, oh, um, what we know so far is that there are banks that control all banks and they are independent from everything else. So 
then you can assume that the debate then is about should they be independent or should they not be independent and what world would it look like so what does dependent mean dependent could mean here this is under the assumption you know nothing about central banks right so you can assume that the debate then becomes about what do we think the central bank should do or who should control the central banks should they control themselves or should the public control them? Should the private sector control them? Should governments be able to control them? Right, so maybe that. But uh, honestly, I think uh, my assumptions weren't far off. So central bank, if you don't know, um, controls reserve requirement, they control monetary policy. So that's a, the, the umbrella there, monetary policy. Control inflation, control printing of money, control the money supply that goes around in the government. That's kind of the goal of the central bank. So our guesses weren't that different. So a central bank to control them all, that's probably the extent of the controls, right? So how do we get stability? Is it if they're independent or if they are not independent? I think education rounds are the easiest to make assumptions on because we all experienced education. I would presume to be a debate like you have to represent the school so you know what education looks like. I think education is two things. How do we treat children? How do children learn and all that? The term here is pedagogy. Or, and then most of the debate which happens all the time is what do we want children to look like as adults, right? Because that's the point of education anyway. So if you want to talk about an education motion, it's really about these two things. What, how do we treat them now while they're in school? And then how do we eventually treat them later on in their life as their adults or what the things they learn as children translates to how they behave as adults later on in life i think media debates are about two fundamental things like the principle is how should media report um or what should media report rather state secrets or um when a crime immediately happens should we report that so those are usually the scope of these debates but also what should people know. So the part about media is um, the privilege of becoming media or the right of media to broadcast. Is that absolute? Should they be able to protect, to broadcast everything? But the other side is about, do we even have the right to know these things? Like you might be divulging state secrets, but people really don't need it and people don't really want it or deserve to know it right so that's the kind of the question of media motions then you also have part of media still is also how should we share the message like and i think this intersects with movement motions it's about how do we make sure that people understand the message or what type of message and how we communicate it to people so it's really media motions um then you also have philo and i really think philo at its course what does the world look like versus what the world should look like based on what philosophy we are debating about in the motion science motions are always about what is ethical and moral to do so you can so it's not just about the benefits of the things that we do that really has to be weighed against our sense of morality and the ethics that govern science so you just have as debaters if you end up with motions about science which you eventually with I think these are core things to start with. So when you put the motion theme together and you put the motion um, the motion type there and then you start making these core assumptions and these core questions later on, even though you don't have examples, even though you don't know anything particularly specific about the debate, you are able to get through when you answer these broad questions that kind of gives that kind of gives you an idea of what the motion will eventually be about or what the motion actually is i think that's a fantastic place to start especially if you're starting out in debate so i wouldn't worry about it so that's really the way that you can survive motions that you don't understand or motions that you don't know anything about um so don't panic i think an important thing to do is to always go back to what do we know what can we assume um how do i draw it out of my memory so i think a huge problem that people encounter as well is that they know something they just don't get to the point that they activate that knowledge or they're like ah oh, yeah i remember i know this um and i think when you start asking these questions based on those three tips that i gave you motion theme motion type and words in the motion 
your brain becomes activated to think about things that you remember or to make some connections that you wouldn't have initially made if you were still panicking about emotion. So in a BP debate, when you have 15 minutes to figure out the case, you don't have time to panic, to cry about it. You should jump in, start making these questions, start making these assumptions based on things that you already know. Um, I think that's a very good place to start. And when I don't understand the motion, I always go back to these basic things. Even when I know the motion, I just don't want to rule out anything. Starting from the basics is always a sure place to be in when you are debating. Yes. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how do you survive with just exam without any examples. So just pure analysis. So again, remember like you have the analytical rigor and you have the factual evidence. So this part we'll talk about the analytical rigor and how do you survive debates with just that, okay? Um, which isn't really hard to think about it. I think it's coming up with examples and that should become harder. Um, so just don't panic again if you don't have any examples because analysis is the way that you're able to solve or work around that problem. So I think there are two basic forms of analysis. I mean, no, not forms, like my two tips or my two strategies for creating basic analysis. The first is by identifying actors, identifying actors. And the second is therefore identifying their incentive structures. So in creating a thick, thicker speech to erase the fact that you don't have any examples or you don't know much about the debate, I think it's very important to do these two things. You can talk about multiple actors. Um, I'll, I'll teach you later on how to break that down. And then you can also talk about each of these actors. What are their incentive structures, incentive structure, incentive structure. And I think that's a better way to help you guys be able to deal with um, going through without having to make examples in the worst case that you don't. Uh, yes. OK, so on the first thing, which is identifying actors, I think all debates are really about people. So you don't need examples. You only need to talk about people. And there are two ways that you can do this. You can break it down into a micro perspective. So everything micro is about how individuals behave. And I think macro are probably about how institutions or big groups behave. Like an individual behaves differently from the way that their community will behave. So there are different nuances on individual. But you can also make assumptions as to uh, the community would probably just generally behave the same way. So the, there are differences in these. So things under macro, things look like corporations as a whole. So they are an uh, institution. They are an aggregate of more than just one person. Or you can also have governments. governments but in governments, you also need to notice that there's a micro perspective to governments. There are voters, there are individual voters, but there are also groups of voters. There are also um, politicians, and these politicians probably have different incentives or different things running through their head that is different from everyone in the government. In corporations, even like the CEO might want different things compared to their shareholders, compared to their workers, compared to their recipients. So you need to break down all these macro institutions into their micro perspectives or vice versa. When you put different individuals together, do they comprise a certain macro thing or something, an institution? So like a religion versus so religion is its own macro thing but the institution of the church is also another macro thing but there are priests there are religious leaders there are worshipers right um so all of these things also comprise your macro perspective and then if you break them down you also therefore get a more micro perspective about other things within these groups so when you see a motion um, I think it's really important that you break it down into these different perspectives. At least that's a good starting point when you don't really know inherently what the debate is about. So when you talk about actors, you must be specific as you can with the actors that you choose to talk about. So it's not just a person. It's not just a corporation. 
we need to break it down to what type of person we're talking about and what type of corporation we're talking about. The second thing, finding therefore the incentive structures. So here we're going to talk about how do you break down people and how do you analyze how they eventually behave and what type of things they eventually So one of the things I looked at when I'm trying to identify actors, like what I mentioned earlier, how do we get to specific actors is through market segmentation. I think this is also how we are able to break apart how they think and why they think and what they eventually do. Um, so there's so many applications to this. So this is four. There are four things that you can look up, uh, look into about the person. The first is their demographic factors. Then you have their geographic, their psychographics, and their behaviors. So in terms of demographics, these are facts about them, and there's little that they can do to change that situation. Um, well, there is, but uh, sometimes there isn't. Like your age, your race, your gender, your occupation. These are things that are kind of fixed and more difficult to change. Um, and your income and your education are probably also dependent on factors outside of your control. I think in part of this demographics is also your religion, right? So you can think of demographics as um, the, who they are that drives their actions, right? I think a lot of the times the way that people behave is dependent on the demographics. And you also have geographic that I think intersects with this. This is generally your location. I think there's a lot that you can know about a group and about a person and about by their geographic location. Like remember earlier in the example about Ethiopia, like if you don't know anything about Ethiopia, one of the first assumptions that we made was, well, they're in Africa, right? So there are um, things that we're already able to assume based on these geographic locations that influence like the demographics of Ethiopia as a country and Africa as a continent. Um, and so these are the things that we're able to break down already. Then you have your psychographics, which is the person's values, opinions, and interests. Um, so this is basically why they do the things that they do. So what are their driving forces? Um, and you have your behaviors, which are their habits. So these are the things that they do every day, the things that they do at some points in their lives or so these are the yeah so basically just what they do right um so like mothers want what's best for their children it's kind of like a psychographic thing because it's their opinion it's their value the value of a mother is to take care of their children the behavior therefore is taking care of their children your demographics is their mothers their women their um yeah so <laughs> that's their demographic um and then their psychographics are everything that makes them a mother in the way that they think demographics probably they have a child right so that's clearly how you that's like one if that statement itself already breaks on a person a type of mother she's not just a person she's a mother she's not just any type of mother she's a mother that cares for her children right so these are already like some analysis that you're able to start analyzing in the debate into an end action. You realize these things actually intersect and affect each other, like demographics and your geographic factors affect your psychographics. So where you were born, where you were raised affects how you think, because like if you went to a Catholic school, that's kind of like a demographic geographic intersection that will obviously inspire how you think. And the way that you think affects, therefore, the way that you behave. Um, so that's why you can make a lot of assumptions if you don't have any clear examples as to what people do. So it's therefore about working backwards. Why do people do this? So the motion about this house would ban guns. The behavior of that person would use uh, would do when they have a gun is probably to shoot people, or their behavior could be to protect themselves. The psychographics is why they want to shoot people. So there might be mental illness, right? Um, so why were they able to enact that behavior or mental illness? Probably because of their demographics, where they come from. Maybe they don't have enough money. Maybe they are bullied, right? Um, so they would lash out, and this is the way that they lash out. Therefore, we need to prevent how people are able to do that, right? So that's the type of analysis that you have. This might, you don't need facts to prove that. That's why the person did that act. You just need to work backwards from this end behavior. These are the psychographics and demographics, right? 
or in mo in a different motion like this house would provide scholarships only for the underprivileged um right so you would end up like oh so the end action that we want is they want them to be successful but how do you make them successful given their current demographic factors right as we said that your demographics affects your psychographics and affects your behaviors so if we want them to be successful they need to be educated which is their psychographics but to be educated they need to make sure we need to make sure that they have access to clean i mean to clear education and to quality education um but that's limited by where they are their income and um yeah just generally their capacity to be able to spend on a clear education so therefore does scholarships fit into that so you don't need again any clear examples as to how scholarships have helped um john smith or some random person like john doe right so these are already like assumptions that you're able to make and you're able to logically derive based on this framework of demographic geographic psychographics and behaviors so it makes you know it makes your life quite easy so much easier to be able to figure out these things um so i would suggest like this is a clear place to start okay have an example here okay so there's this rat so i grabbed this out of the uh this photo <laughs> i don't know who he is um he's from the creative uh creative communes right i just searched person and one of the people who appeared is this guy named jack the i named jack and so i would assume like um because he's in a suit and he's he's quiet um so that's probably that is going to go into his demographic so i'd assume that his generation is baby boomers he probably has a master's degree like a mba or something he's probably part of the one percent and a ceo and white like clearly white Right, and then you can throw in like uh, his geographic factors. This is from the southern USA, right? So then you can even throw in like what his religious leanings are and all that. So that, those will affect his demographics. So I think his psychographics. I think like a lot of the bo baby boomers believe in hard work. I think they were sold with the idea that you have to work hard to succeed in life. Given when they were born, it was like out of. I don't know when were baby boomers born. So maybe like. Um, Maybe like post World War II, that whole time. Like, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of turmoil in the world, and there's a lot of trying to reconstruct the way that we work and the way that they went. So I think like that affected their psychographic, um, because he already has an MBA or he's probably a CEO. He also probably also wants to keep winning and make sure that he does his job or that his company gets everything that they want, um, and that's really like his psychographic. So that's why his end behaviors. He's dedicated to his work, um. And because he believes in hard work, he lobbies to protect his own wealth because he feels like he deserves it and probably also doesn't support higher taxation. So this is the, like the ways that you can break it down as to why this is the likely behavior, like the likely outcome. So remember earlier in our breakdown of um, what an argument looks like, an argument is premise, analysis, conclusion. Your end conclusion could be these, the behaviors of this person based on the psychographics, based on their geographics, based on the demographics, based on who they are and what they go through as people, or even what institutions would look like. So for a company, it would probably look like what type of company are they? Are they a startup? Are they a fintech? Are they technology? Are they Facebook? Are they a bank, right? But you know that in their core, their psychographics and their motives is to make profit. But sometimes making profit either harms people or forces them to find better ways to earn profit that is more efficient, but also doesn't sacrifice people. So their end behavior could be like Facebook supporting solar farming, but it could also be Facebook at the same time being a tool for politicians to win elections or to rig the elections and all that. So the behaviors, again, that are determined by their psychographics and are also determined by the demographic facts of what this company looks like or you can even do this the same thing with most governments um and countries based on what the country wants to be able to achieve right so remember earlier in intern in ir debates i said that ir debates are about the flow of power and where do we want power to go so if the debate then is about a country like the philippines and what end behavior they eventually want to go to 
you can work break it down again to what the country is going through, what it looks like, where they're going. Similar to what we did to Ethiopia again, like the demographics of an Ethio of Ethiopia, what behaviors they're able to do if they have a dam. So these are things again that you can look into. So uh, so let's talk about Ethiopia again as an example. Their probably end behavior is of using the dam will clearly limit the supply of water that affects communities in other countries that don't have the dam or don't have access to the Nile River anymore, right? So you can say there's psychographics. What can you use with a dam? What do you get from a dam? One thing you can get from a dam is um, more water reserve. Um, you can talk about also irrigation systems because of the controlled water. But I think one of the clearest uh, uses is energy supply. So they can use the turbines and the water pressure to be able to make uh, make to generate sorry to generate electricity. Right, so that's their psychography and that's their behavior. Probably because the country, their fact, the fact is they don't have a clear source of water or a, a clear source of electricity in that area, um, and that clear lack of electricity might mean that they're not able to have stable industries, and that lack of stable industries means that people are impoverished or people don't have clear job, stable jobs, and all that. So therefore, they constructed this dam so that they're able to achieve all of these things. Right, so a way to analyze and not have to really have clear examples so we don't know if that's true but we know that it's logically plausible to be true based on their incentive structures that we have broken down and that we've analyzed into these four major buckets of demographics geographic psychographics and behaviors right it's a cool trick so i would suggest that you guys get on to working on this and learning how to use this as well so if you don't have time to read a lot of things, you just make these core assumptions based on what you already know and these four major buckets, which honestly doesn't go wrong. So here, so yeah, as I said, like you can say that um, demographic, geographic, and psychographics are your analytical rigor. This is how you prove that something is logically true because you're trying to get to the conclusion that they don't support higher taxation or they don't support um wealth redistribution right because they want to protect their wealth because they believe that it is their own hard work so yeah so that's how you don't have to use examples but you just use analysis to be able to survive without that i think these are clear ways remember like earlier i said like we can use example uh you can use questions to be able to achieve this i think this is a clear way to do that so remember like earlier how do we bucket questions we bucket it based on words of the motion themes of theme of the motion and the um type of the motion right so don't forget these three things so the, what you're learning right now on demographics geographic on market segmentation generally just helps you um create thicker questions those three core things that i've mentioned earlier that you can use as a strategy um yes okay so next is what we call the ida analysis so this is a theory of how people think um and how people act so if you this kind of does intersect with the previous thing on market segmentation because it's about awareness um it's about what people do and why people do it so you start with awareness so it, it says that um so this is ranked in order of ease of knowing something like that so like it is easier for a person to know something versus it is easier for a person to act on something so the reason why it's an inverted triangle is because um getting to the next level is harder or there are less people that get to the next level the lower level between awareness and action you can know this is the thing that you should do but it doesn't mean you want to do it or that doesn't mean you have the desired interest to do it uh, and so therefore that doesn't mean that you're going to end up doing it eventually right so awareness um so it funnels down like based on like either number of people or the ability capacity and willingness of people to do the end action um so the ida model or the ida analysis says that if a person doesn't have any awareness about an action they're less likely to be interested they're less likely to desire they're less likely to do that action Right, so everything that you know affects everything that you eventually do, um, 
and your in between your doing and your knowing is your interest and your desire to do that. So I don't know like what the, um, for this lecture we'll just assume that interest and desire is the same thing. There is some minute nuance difference as either rated as two different things, but so that not to butcher this framework that I'm borrowing because I didn't create this framework, um, we would just assume. I, I just wanted to be clear that for this lecture, we'll just assume that they are the same thing. Right. Okay, so again, if our end conclusion is about an outcome, your awareness, interest, desire, and your are your analytical rigor. Um, to show that something is logically true or the outcome that you're trying to drive at is logically true. Yeah, so for example, um, assuming like a person grows up in a conservative community, you know, you can assume that all they'll ever probably know is based on what they were taught to believe like everyone, based on education, based on propaganda, based on our religious upbringing. Um, so unless you have other sources, but you know, it's a, like you can easily assume as well that it's unlikely that people have other sources to learn the things that they learn from their community, from their education, from their conservatism, from their religion, given that we spend more time in these things, right? So you can therefore say that their awareness of the world based on this conservative lens therefore affects how they think conservatively and how they behave conservatively. So this could be used in debates about, um, so maybe like movements, maybe some women were raised to be faithful for, to their husbands, that their husbands are the breadwinners. It's probably a religious thing in a patriarchal society and all that. So uh, even though from a different perspective, you believe that women shouldn't be subjugated to their men and to their husbands, but from the perspective of this woman that we're particularly talking about, who grew up in the conservative community, this is all they know and this is what they were taught to believe. Therefore, this is what they're only interested in doing and interested in interested in doing and desire and and have the action to actually do it, right? So that's why it's a funnel. So the way that in most debates that you have to correct a person's action always starts with awareness, making sure that they are aware of that they have alternatives. Like you don't have to just be subjugate that to with your husband. That's not just the way it is because your religion says so. There are so many alternatives to that. But just because you make someone aware about their options doesn't mean that they have the interest, desire to do it and then that they will eventually do it as well. So in a lot of the analysis that you will have to put forward in the debate, you have to compare through each stage. Given that we're trying to change their end action what steps do you have to take from awareness to interest to desire that leads to their end action changing? So from their belief that men, that women should be subjugated to their husbands to making them aware that that's not what they should do to the interest, to the desire, to the action, right? So one way that you can do this is maybe this woman wants to make her own decisions, right? Even though she believes that it is the right thing to do to follow their, their husband, she already has an inherent interest, an inherent desire that she might not want to do that all the time. That's why, they, again, it's a funnel. So just because you know, just because you desire, doesn't mean you do it. So sometimes she feels like, you know what, I know I have to listen to my husband, but sometimes I don't want to do it. So she doesn't have the interest and desire. So it becomes a, that becomes a opportunity to explain in the debate that you know if we tell her that you know what you can do other things uh, you don't have to always follow your husband so that already recaptures their interest and desire and says you know there are other things that you can do such that we can change the end action of this person so if you analyze a lot that that's how people think that their awareness interest desire and action does not always translate but you always need what's on top to get to the bottom your opportunity for getting changes before the end action happens will take place in the awareness, interest, desire, right? Because your end action of a person will be limited by all those three things from up above. But another thing to think about is actions. The reason why the action is the smallest point of, of the triangle is also because action is not just determined by awareness, interest, and desire, but it's also determined by 
the in the sorry the capacity of the person to do that right so as we talked about earlier you if you recall the the market segmentation lecture that i just gave it is in the demographics and the geographic that inspire a particular action so a woman might want to drive um but that, that but um but they might not have the income to get a car right so they might have the awareness that they can drive they might have the interest and desire to drive but they don't have a car to drive so in a lot of the debates that you will encounter you have to assess what stage of these four things is where we encounter a problem do we encounter a problem already just in the action or do we encounter a problem in the awareness like they don't know they have other choices like i don't have to be subjugated to my husband or is there a problem in the interest and desire like i know i don't have to be subsumed by my husband but my interest and desire are weighed against the harms that i'll experience if i go against my husband or the the impact of the action that i will eventually take so a lot of the debate if you don't have examples you have to just rely on assessing where the problem happens based on the way that people behave on these four on this type of analysis right it's a problem again from awareness it's a problem from interest desire or action so you just need to mm, <laughs> you need to analyze that part um and then how do you change that how do you correct that based on where we are on those levels yes okay the next thing that we will talk about is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs so um this is one common thing that we learn a lot it is basically about what people want and the priority of them wanting that uh, not just want but need as human beings so you, like on most of the debates this is a default thing so again you you'll realize that this intersects with the earlier things that i was talking about um so you know like they can all just merge together into like one super framework that you can use if you don't have examples because you have all of these ways of thinking and um these are way where you can draw inspiration for creating analysis when you don't have a clear example or a clear grounding for um for what you need to be able to ground in the debate mm -hmm. okay so yeah so muscle hierarchy of needs has five levels so for the top most is self-actualization, then you have esteem, love and belongingness, safety needs, and physiological needs. So the assumption here are these are anything and everything that a person will need in their throughout their lifestyle. I mean lifetime. Yes. Um and the most and the the reason why it's a pyramid is because you need the base and you need the things below the thing on top to be able to progress to the higher levels. So it says here that your primary needs need need to be fulfilled first and your higher order needs need rely on lower needs being fulfilled first. So um, here it so our physiological needs are our basic needs, things like air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing. You can say that if you don't have air, what's the point of having self-esteem? What's the point of having social status and social recognition? It doesn't matter because you'll be dead you'll not be alive so every human being pursues the thing at the bottom first and then depending on where they are in their lives the next things above that right so that's why like you know like for example love and belongingness versus physiological needs sometimes people will screw you over and sometimes like you can't trust people right and that's probably because um they're trying to pursue a different need on top of just being friends right um so for example like you know if someone stabs in the back that might be a safety need right so <laughs> terrible example i know but the point stands so you need the things that are below a lot of the debates people are like you know what this is the best way for people to receive self-actualization to be who they are the most one can be right but a lot of the times in debates so this happens a lot in movements motions where um, there's a lot of claims that ah, somebody has to be out and proud to be gay to live their life because they need to self-actualize but 
should you really be out and proud when you live in the context of a conservative Muslim country? No, because what is more important to this person or to any person is their safety needs, their personal security, making sure they have resources, they have property, they have employment. And maybe being out and proud and being openly gay harms that safety need. So it might mean they have self-actualization, but they are not at that point in their life where that is the most important need because the lower order needs or their primary needs aren't fulfilled yet. So here what you can use in the debate are, is one, you assess where this person is and then you can justify that because that's where that person is. These are the things that they will need. So it already becomes secondly comparative because you're therefore able to say, therefore like, you know, we don't need that thing on top because this is where we are. We're still at the bottom and we don't have to prioritize those things on top yet. Okay. So you just need to assess. So this helps you also assess um, the process by which people get there. Um, so maybe in some debates you can like explain the process right but a lot of the times it's really just the reason why this is important is because people need their physiological needs or the reason why this is more important than something else is because safety needs are the most important thing um, because it allows people to have access to all their other rights and all their other capacities as a human being so that's why like it's important to analyze again where this person is on this thing mm -hmm. Um, so you have to analyze where people are on their stages to determine what they're likely to do and how they're likely to pursue it. So what are people likely to do to get their physiological needs? What are people likely to do to get their safety needs, to get love and belongingness, right? So I think people behave differently. Like nobody really steals. So if you like, for example, poor people, you would say that a poor person steals because they need to fulfill their social their physiological needs. You're not going to say like um, a person steals because they need to be self-actualized. Like you're not a criminal. You're just someone who has needs and that's your physiological needs. Or you can say that a man with a gun in, and an intruder coming in will shoot that man intruding because they need to pursue their safety needs as a person in their house, right? So those are just examples of what people are willing to do and what they usually do to, to pursue um, the need and based on the stage that they currently are in. Mm -hmm. For example, so here, um, this is probably true in the Philippines. So that's the example, Philippines. But this is how you can analyze it. Even if you didn't know that this is what's happened in the Philippines, you can just analyze that this is likely what's gonna exist. So you can make a claim that quarantines and a pandemic are likely to be ineffective because poor people will still want to go to their jobs more than anything. So this means like they could have a constructing jo construction job or they might have, so they might have like any job like at all. Um, and if you're poor, a poor person is still likely to want to pursue their physiological needs first, even if it might risk their safety. So the harm to their safety here is the coronavirus. So people often, um, and a lot of the time, like in a lot of the news in the Philippines, it's about, um, there's a lot of complaints that yes, I might not die of the coronavirus, but I will definitely die from hunger. Um, so I would still have to go out and look for ways to earn money, even though it might risk me getting coronavirus. So the, it shows that there's a lot of prioritization that goes into getting food over um, the threat of this virus. So, like, so there's clear examples that I already used there um, of what's happening in the Philippines. But if you even just didn't know that that was happening in the Philippines, you could just logically explain that safety in the face of the coronavirus is secondary compared to the need to eat and the need to pay rent. Because if you don't have rent, you don't have shelter. If you don't have shelter, you don't have safety as well. So it doesn't matter, right? So it's really important to assess who this person is. So again, the only re way that you're able to get to this Maslow's hierarchy of needs is if you're able to analyze what is their demographics, what is their geographics. Because I think a lot of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs analysis um, 
is also more psychographic and more behavioral, what people pursue and why people pursue that and how they pursue it. So that's the same with the IDA model and the awareness. Um, I think this needs go to the, well, I know I'm hungry, I want to eat, therefore I eat, right? So, but it could be in a comparison of other needs. So I'm, I'm just saying that the way to get an effective Maslow's hierarchy of needs analysis is if you have clear breakdown of what person you're talking about, where they are in their life, their demographic and their geographic, such that it influences their psychographic stages. So remember earlier, I said that the demographic factors of a person affects their psychographic. So that's what we mean by a poor person wants to get food. So a poor person, their demographic, affects their desire for a physiological need, which is the base of the triangle that you see on the slide. So I think that's really important to have to flesh out and have to analyze so that you're better able to prove that this is the direction that people need to go or like in your debate, like you're explaining that this is the important direction for that matter. Okay. Mm, yep. Yeah. So that's basically what people want and what people prioritize based on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, so the last thing I have on my list for incentive structures. So if you forget everything else that I taught you, you just need to remember two things. People avoid a harm and they pursue a benefit. And that happens in order of importance. So it is always to avoid the harm rather than to pursue a benefit. Um, the reason why this is true is because people are more averse to pain but can live without some benefits. So that means that you can slap someone and a person would just want to avoid to get slapped even though that means they don't gain anything or they don't have a benefit. Um, that's why like a lot of the times in the cost analysis, cost benefit analysis, right? It's always the cost that comes first. That's why it's cost benefit. Ooh. Um, so like people do consider a lot of the times what harms that they end up accruing um, because that's more felt rather than the benefit. So sometimes the benefit is good, but you just need to understand that people will pursue a avoiding of a harm. Um, so in any debate, if you're not sure what to talk about, just talk about the existence of a harm. Therefore, people should do otherwise or people should um, find something else. So that's why in a lot of debates, one of the key things that you have to find and you have to figure out in prep is, is there a problem that needs solving? And the reason why that's important is because a problem is more urgent, it's more compelling for a judge to believe that a problem has to be solved because people are getting harmed. Versus if you say, let's do this policy because it benefits people in these particular ways. But we would end up asking ourselves, do people need that particular benefit or not, right? But when it's avoiding a harm, it's quite clear that nobody wants to get hurt versus benefits that do people really want that benefit? Is that benefit really important? So in most of the prioritization of debates, if you look at a lot of debates, you'd realize that that's really quite the order by which people make decisions or we explain people make decisions in the debate or why the government should do particular actions because a problem exists. So it's really a lot of the times based on problems and harms rather than based on what good eventually happens. She might be telling me like, oh, Papa, isn't pursuing a benefit, isn't not getting harmed a benefit in and of itself. That's probably true, but you can also pursue a benefit without having to avoid the harm, right? But all avoiding of a harm does not automatically mean pursuing a benefit. So you just look at it on a spectrum, like there's harm on one side, benefit on the other, but in the middle, there's nothing. Right, so if you avoid the harm, when you avoid the harm, you just get nothing. You don't automatically get a benefit, right? So you should just think of that. So people just at least want to be in the neutral middle 
rather than here where there is a harm. But people would prefer to have some extra benefits, right? So that's kind of like the structure and the order, the way that you can think of it. Okay. So now we're moving on to the next part of our lecture, which is about using examples. Um, a lot of the times, a lot of debaters just throw a lot of examples here and there. But as I mentioned earlier, the reason why you need the best of both worlds is because examples, there are so many examples to prove any point, but it's really hard to say that your example is one true in the context of the debate because a judge doesn't know, doesn't have Google in their heads to know that what you're saying is actually true or what you're saying might just be claims and you might just be lying and throwing false matter into the debate. So while judges are encouraged to be um, average, in, I mean, uh, informed citizen of the world, being informed does not mean knowing everything. You just know some of the basics. So as a judge, a lot of the times you encounter a problem when the debaters are just throwing a lot of facts and throwing a lot of examples. So in this part, I'll probably take it to tips as to how you effectively use examples so you don't fall into that precise problem. Okay, so um, there are two general types of examples that you guys, um, or these like buckets for examples that you guys can think of. The first is called trends and the second is called proof. Um, I just want to make this distinction because while it might not be so obvious, there's still both examples. Trends look are forward looking, like in the future, this will eventually happen based on these series of actions. Proof is you're proving something, usually proving something already happened, or at least like my definition of it for the purposes of this lecture is just that we're proving that something has happened in the past. So anything that is forward looking is a trend, like or requires examples for a trend. Anything that is looking backwards or at least trying to prove the existence of history is proof that that history happened. Because uh, you can't trend towards history, but you can trend to a past thing and you can prove to a future thing. But just, um, I just want to make it distinct for this purpose. Like you can. Yeah, just just remember the proof um, is usually just grounding, while trends are usually just um, prediction that lead to a prediction, right? Um, events might have happened in the past, and then there are trends that led up to that event. So that quote, that's true, that's possible. That, but that I would still classify that as proof because it's things that already happened in the future. Um, but there are also proofs that show that, you know what, that the world is there for ending. But also at the same time, I would just call those trends for the purposes of this and the way that I believe it. So yeah, so I would say that trends predict the future and proof prove the past. So you don't have to like take this as fact. You just need to note that like there are like some form of a distinction in the types of examples that you use exist, right? So this isn't a hard fact. You don't have to believe me, but that's just what the way that I want to explain it. Okay. So a trend, so again, that's the way I defined it as a series of actions. So you probably, I would say like there's, there's no trend if it's just one thing. I would say that a trend is more solid and concrete if there's at least three. Two kind of okay, but one, honestly, you can't call that a trend. So you can't say like World War II happened because of this one thing. World War II was probably a buildup of a number of things, right? A number of instances. So it's not just a trend. Or you can say like the Philippines is becoming a dictatorship because one thing, <laughs> uh, because Duterte became president, right? So that doesn't prove anything. Um, it could just be a one isolated incident. So again, so like the way that you can think of this is there are rules of the universe, but there are also sometimes exceptions to the rule. A trend or showing a trend at least proves that this is not the exception, but it is the rule. Okay. Um, yeah, so exceptions and rules. 
So to show that it's not just a one-time thing, you have to show that it is a trend, and that there are multiple instances. That something similar happened like this. Mm, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, Philippines. Okay, so <laughs> I made this PowerPoint. I should have done. So, for example, the claim is the Philippines is plunging into dictatorship. Into a dictatorship. So, my proofs for this is, or oh, so yeah, so my claim would probably be more specifically Duterte is plunging the Philippines into a dictatorship. So, I have three um, instances by which this clearly is more clearly happening. One, there's the militarization of the coronavirus response. So instead of using more healthcare workers, we think of a lot of our, diff our spending went to the military, right? So weird. Uh, <laughs> and making checkpoints or deploying the military. And you would think that maybe like we're using the military for relief effort, but honestly, that's not kind of where the direction went to. Um, yeah. So that's one. The second is um, Maria Ressa, so she's a pro prominent journalist and crit critic of the government, was just jailed on founts of libel. Um, so that's another instance. And so the first the first thing shows that um, the use of military, right, that's a big thing in dictatorship. The second thing is the cracking down on media and free press, right? It's not really like, hmm. That's more dictatorship territory, right? And you have the third thing, which is the passing of the anti-terror bill. Um, and the fear here is that this can be interpreted in a way that it jails critics and it jails protesters um, as inciting violence and inciting terrorism, right? And it just got passed. So you could say that these three things, well, I'm, I'm changing the way that you guys are looking at the Philippines. But I'm, you can say that these three things show that there is a problem in the Philippines and that my claim is probably true because of these instances and trends. Um, yes, so there's so many also like, you can say like a bubble is likely to happen um, with like, like in the Bitcoin. So part, I think there were trends that show that the Bitcoin would eventually rapidly deflate because of its rapid expansion so like so here again like I'll, i think here this would kind of mix some proof and fact um which is like one there was no actual usage of the bitcoin people were just buying into it so there was no usage spend it was just spending um so there's an artificial increase of the price um and third like it increased really quickly like too quickly per se right? so therefore it popped so here again so this is me using trends to analyze a part of that happened in history so you can also say this is true with the financial crisis of 2008 um so there were things that led up to that event so you can say these are trends um yes so this will become relevant again later on so we'll just put a pin on that okay um so next is proof so this is grounding that again, something has happened. So where have we seen, seen this before? So if you can make a claim that in the future, the world will collapse, right? Um, you would have to show proof that the world has collapsed in the past. And w w how did we know that it was in the direction of collapsing? Or what were the tells? Or what were the... Um, signs that this was something that was happening so that needs to be also shown and i think that's what so an example here is the government seeks to protect government seek to protect the most vulnerable individuals so um yeah so like there are three proofs to this so like the instances that we have seen this before so public health care is meant to protect the vulnerable sick. So the sick are the vulnerable. Public health care is the way that we do this, given that accessible health care. Um, governments want to offer again violence so that people don't harm each other. So in a harm, uh, in a um, when a crime is being committed, there's somebody that's obviously more vulnerable than another person. And so that's probably what I mean here, that the monopoly in violence therefore protects the more vulnerable person who is having the 
bad act. Who is the recipient of that bad act from the criminal? There, got it. So therefore, the government has a monopoly on violence to prevent those things or to at least resolve those things when it happens. Then you can also talk about redistributive policies like progressive taxation um, that enables the state to provide resources for welfare and for caring for the poor and sick. So there's so many other examples by which the state does these things. Um, but like, you know, like, once again, like rule of three to show that this claim is true. So you just need proof of when we have seen it before. Um, if you don't have proof, if you don't have clear, concrete examples, again, you can use analysis. So somehow these three things that I mentioned kind of also uses analysis that we, we talked about earlier. What are the incentive structures of the government? The vulnerable people are also a voting bloc, so therefore the government wants to protect those. The government was also comprised, like in the constitution, seeks to help people on the ground. Vulnerable people are poor, uh, are people that need help, therefore the government wants to help them. So there are so many sources of analysis and examples, um, which again is why you need both to create the best of both worlds, right? So just always remember that one. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to talk about how do you use these examples, which you will call drawing parallels. So again, you don't just throw examples. So earlier we talked about like what kind of examples you can use and the rule of three. This one we're going to talk about how do you effectively use examples. A lot of the times the British are just like, oh, mother, here's some information. But like as a judge, I'm just like, hold up, what are you trying to tell me? What are you really trying to tell me? And when you just get overwhelmed with these examples, um, so these are the two problems that usually happen. One is trends usually have the problem of just because it's been happening, doesn't mean it will continue to happen, right? So just because there have been a bunch of earthquakes, doesn't mean we're gonna have an earthquake tomorrow, right? So trends don't always show it will continue to happen. You're just showing that maybe it might happen, right? The problem with proof, and there's a typo in this sentence, is that just because something similar has happened before doesn't mean it should continue to happen, right? So like what I said about the government, just because the government has helped vulnerable people doesn't mean in a different debate, um, the government should always act in this way because there might be another interest. Again, so interest incentives, um, analysis, right? Analysis of why the government does its particular actions and it might not always be driven by wanting to help the more vulnerable people. So how do we therefore deal with the problem that we have on trends? What you can do is that you analyze the interest of the actor or the actors involved to keep doing that action. So continue in that direction. So again, as I said, like all people, all debates involve people, therefore people will behave in predictable things. And that's usually based on their incentives and their interests, yes. So as I said, again, you also have to mix examples with analysis, get the best of both worlds. So that's where the analyze their interests are and will become relevant. So you can't just say they did one, two, three. You have to explain why it will lead to the fourth claim that you're trying to make your outcome and a lot of the lecture earlier was really talking about how we build the likelihood of an outcome through analysis and analytical rigor so that's what we're trying to plug in here you are able to effectively use the example of the trends to prove your outcome when you throw in some analytical rigor into the mix and into the analysis that you're trying to make yeah, so remember our claims earlier about Duterte plunging the Philippines into dictatorship? So we have the three examples. So how do we know that it's going to continue on? So my claim would therefore be Duterte wants to maintain power and control. A dictatorship is how he is able to cement this power and control. So all those previous actions were in the direction to get more power. When you have the military, then you have the action, you have that action. When you have no critique, uh, or critics, rather, then you don't have um, anyone to question you. There's no viable opposition. So that means you have control over that power, right? So it's that incentive of that actor 
that shows to us that you know what this is there for the likely action or this is there for likely what is going to happen um yes so yes um uh, so for example north korea you can say like like the claim could be north korea is never going to use itself well you can't say never but like north korea is unlikely to use its nuclear arsenal to bomb its enemies okay so the way that you do you explain this is north korea has had its nuclear warheads forever right and the recent testings have shown that they, for a long time it had the capacity to hit important centers or important cities it hasn't done that yet so right so there's a trend to do that and so but the incentive why they don't want to do that is once they hit someone that's the point of no return that they will be responded to with military violence and they are even they're more likely to lose everything right um and it even shows that they're be, they've been willing to so here another trend that they've been willing to engage with diplomatic talks with like president with donald trump and in singapore and all that so therefore there's an incentive for north korea to not use and there has been clear examples that they haven't used it offensively or directly offensively right so you use trends to show that they don't have the interest to do this and you show incentives for them to not actually do this particular action so again you get the best of both worlds you get a more compelling story or you get a more compelling case and argument to prove that your claim is true so with proof on the other hand when you encounter these problems um what you have to explain is the conditions that are similar such that a similar action needs to take place or will take place i think this is actually also useful for trends you just have to show that there are similar conditions so the most generic form of this is we did we did we did these acts because condition xyz was present when these conditions are there we must um, perform the actions or the action will happen so i think this kind of like trends yeah so for example yeah so for example um, in what we talked about earlier, governments seek to protect the most vulnerable individuals. The end condition that I think you can claim is every time there's somebody that is vulnerable and someone has to be privileged, the state intervenes and protects and redistributes that power. I think another example that I can think of for this though is, um, so for example, world wars. You could say that world wars have the same conditions based on the trends that we can see like there's a um there's a diminishing belief in the world order and the organizations and allyship so all you can see that allyships are breaking down so then you can say the same conditions exist today right or you can say there are new skirmishes or a bounty of proxy wars so that's also a condition then you can say like oh that will that exist as well in status quo with how there's so many wars and conflicts in the middle east and in south and african countries that are being proxy wars for major countries that have to want to advance their political interests or you can also say there's an increasing scarcity of resources so that leads to the scarce the resource insecurity of both countries drives them also to therefore take up arms the same condition also exists in status quo and you explain you give examples when these happens right so again um this is where a lot of things mix to create a good argument so what i want you to take away is that you don't look at all of the tools that i taught you and just look at them at one thing at, after the other but rather that they all intersect and they all cooperate with each other like drawing parallels with proofs and trends uh, in showing interests, showing conditions, showing um, all the incentive structures that we talked about earlier. I think these all intersect to eventually create better and stronger examples. I mean, better and stronger arguments when you do have examples or when you don't have examples. Um, and I think that's really key to understand that they don't they're not mutually exclusive from each other, but they all exist to cooperate 
and to help each other um, in making these more clear and more extensive analysis. Yeah, so just keep that in mind as well. Okay, so the last part here that I'm going to talk about is matter loading. Um, so if you're already an avid reader, then this, pro this part isn't for you. But if you're not an avid reader, like how I started out, then the question is really about how do you develop the habit? So I really have only one advice for matter loading if you don't like matter loading. And I think like one is to integrate it heavily into your existing lifestyle. So what I did during when I was still an active waiter, and I still have it right now, um, the only way that I make sure that I have, I'm up to date with what's happening is you follow new sites with your social media account. So what I did for Facebook, and I don't open my Facebook anymore now because it's just full of news, is you pin everything to the top. So there are so many news accounts that I follow, like BBC, CNN, the New York Times, and The Economist, Vice, um, Atlantic, uh, Vox. Um, I even followed like a lot of conservative things like Fox, Breitbart, even um, the uh, the New Independent, and then Foreign Policy. Um, yeah, so you know there are so many news sites that you can follow on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram to make sure that you always keep up to the news and you're always seeing news all the time. So you might not have, you don't have to read everything, but I think this is an important step to at least knowing something about the world, right? So you read the headlines and then you read the news if it picks your interest, but you can come into debate and you're like, I know that this thing happened then, right? And the reason why like, I prefer this method more is because when you get so invested in a topic, you're not even sure if the topic you're reading about will eventually come out in the debate tournament that you're going to this weekend. But when you read a lot of headlines, you're able to cover more things and you're able to see the world more. That at least one of those things that you did read about will probably come out in the tournament that you're about to attend. So at least you know you're not blank for all of the, all of the motions or not blank all in all because you invested in the wrong topic and i think that's like one of the key things that helped me so the key then is how do you utilize a headline and the way that you honestly utilize a headline is by all of the analysis that i talked about earlier you just reanalyze you just ask you break it down you make assumptions you question based on these core things that you we've talked about earlier on i think that's really like a good start for making sure that you show up to a debate motion not without drawing blank right um so yeah so i think that's like one of my key advice for matter loading you can read as much as you want but you're also again like a lot of matter loading is just gambling and hoping that it comes out but when you read headlines you don't get to invest that you cover more ground you just have to rely on the analysis but at least you have some examples to ground things up you might not know when exactly there was a bombing you might not know exactly when the last uh, missile testing of North Korea happened, but you know these things happened. Um, and that's really like what you can take away from headlines. And that's really oh, the thing that matters with a judge, because the judge won't say, ah, that's not true. It didn't happen on June 3rd or whatever. Because the judge will just believe you. Um, they have no way, unless like, you know, they, 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 they read more matter than you do and memorize facts, really. So you don't have to be super specific as well with the matter that you're using. You just have to be correct. If you use matter and if you use examples, please be accurate. Do not lie. Like, yeah, it's so much more tempting to lie to the judge and say, you know what, this is fact. But honestly, that's just not fair in debates. And we must keep like some things in debate fair and some things beautiful. And so when a fact, when you're not sure about your matter, just please don't lie about your matter. Rather, you use analysis or you use the things that you do know. Um, because that just muddles up a lot of debate when one debater is saying the truth and you're just there lying your ass off. It's just a struggle, right? So don't make things up. Just use analysis and explain that this is likely to be true. You don't have to guarantee like this is 100% true because nothing is 100% in this world. Well, 
Um, but you can show that some things are more likely and some things are more plausible. And that's really the best that you can do, especially when you don't understand what's happening in the debate. Um, so with that, yes, yeah, so I think that ends my lecture. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot and with analysis and examples. So again, key things to remember, if you don't understand anything, start with three things. One, what words in the motion are there and what assumptions I can draw. Two, what key things in the motion theme and the motion type am I able to use? Oh yeah, so I have a recap slide. So yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, if you don't know anything, words in the motion, theme of the motion, types of motion. So those are the three things you can rely on. For analysis, you got to start with identifying actors because all debates are just all about people, how people behave, how you want people to behave. Then utilize the incentive structures that we talked about from market segments to the item model to the mass of hierarchy of needs and the harms and benefits. And then to examples, strands, proofs, um, interests, and conditions. So yeah, so if you see a motion that you don't understand, don't freak out. There's something that you always know. Don't doubt yourself. Believe in what you already know and try to make do of your situation and try to make the most out of it. You can do it. You just have to trust in yourself that you know it. And with these tools, I hope that you will be able to do it. Thank you everyone so much for, thank you so much everyone for listening to this lecture. I hope you guys learned a lot. Yeah. Have a great day life. Um, yeah, thank you.